All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. The listeners don't get the pre-show banter that I get, so sometimes it might seem like I'm faking enthusiasm, but uh, we get some good conversation before the show and some uplifting jokes and sometimes some crazy jokes, so I'm in a good mood today. Yeah, me too. All right. Well, today we're going to take a look at a new look at an old question. What does it take to become a really, really good copywriter? I want to answer this question by zeroing in on the path of mastery. I've been learning about the path of mastery for a long time. And, you know, what I found out goes against what I learned in school and what I see on TV and in the movies except for maybe a few movies. Our culture celebrates achievers and achievement, but it does not respect the path of mastery very much. I'm lucky in that I know a number of copywriters who are well along this path, including a few who are personal friends and a few more who are my mentoring clients. And to prepare for this show, I went back to the books I've been reading since 2009 to flesh out my ideas and observations. A few surprises, some new information, but nothing goes against anything I've noticed and concluded up till now. So what we're gonna do today is pick up some key points from great books about mastery and weave that all together with some practical down-to-earth tactics and approaches for getting really, really good at copywriting. Starting, of course, with this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. Uh, The way I see it in copywriting, the word mastery is a term to describe having so many skills and so much knowledge at your fingertips that what you do looks effortless to someone watching you. Now, it's not really effortless, but it's certainly different when you do something after having prepared yourself to get really good and having done it in a certain way. And there is a known and documented process to get to this place. A better way to say that is to get on this path because mastery, as it turns out, is much more a path than a place. It's more a journey than a destination. It's more a way of continuously working on your skills rather than a badge that you put up on your website. When you're well along the path of mastery, you may be able to solve problems and come up with ideas in a fraction of the time. It takes someone with less experience to do the same thing. And when you do it, it often seems effortless to the person watching. If they knew what was going on under the hood, they would know better. It's not excruciating, but it's not always that easy either. In copywriting at the highest levels, being able to perform at a high level is important. Why? Because somehow, as copywriters, we find ourselves in situations where we have to fix things or change directions under great time pressure. If you have the ability to go with the flow in situations like that, it can make all the difference in the world. Today, we won't talk much about the amazing feats of master copywriters, but we'll take a really good look at how they got there and how you can get there too. Because when the heat is on, you'll want to be there yourself. When everyone's counting on you, you want them to feel good about how you perform. And the advantages are you have more choices and more opportunities. You end up working with more interesting people on more interesting projects. And last but not least, you end up getting paid a lot more money. Okay, so before we jump into the four parts of this podcast, any any thoughts about this in general or in specific? I like the a lot more money part. Yeah, who doesn't? <laughs> um, I think there are some people who hate money, but 
They usually don't become copywriters. No, they become musicians. Okay, (laughs) so part one. Part one, practice doesn't make perfect, but practice for mastery keeps making you better and better. So let's start with a quote from a musician to set the stage. Pablo Casals, one of the greatest cello players of all time. He was in his 90s, and when he was asked why he continued to practice several hours every day, he replied, I think I'm making progress. On the surface, it sounds like it could be a sarcastic answer, a what a dumb question answer. And who knows, maybe it was at one level. But also, as you'll see throughout today, there's a simple honesty, almost a profound quality to his answer. Practice is the secret weapon of the person on the path to mastery. Practice is such an ordinary word that people have given it special names when it comes to the particular application people take when they're on the path of mastery. The generally accepted world expert on mastery is a Florida State University professor named Anders Ericsson. And his term for the practice in mastery is deliberate practice. Along with science writer Robert Poole, Ericsson co-authored a terrific book called Peak. Copy of it here, Peak. And here's what they say in the book about deliberate practice. It's different from other sorts of purposeful practice in two important ways. First, it requires a field that is already reasonably well-developed. That is a field in which the best performers have attained a level of performance that clearly sets them apart from the people who are just entering the field. Second, deliberate practice requires a teacher who can provide activities designed to help a student improve his or her performance. Of course, there can be such teachers. Before there can be such teachers, there must be individuals who have attained a certain level of performance using practice methods that the teacher can pass on to others. Okay, two things. Well-developed field and a teacher to help the student improve the performance. Copywriting is pretty well developed as a field because what we do is measurable and we can determine what high performance is based on results and other statistics. And as a business activity, it's been around a while. We've been doing this for over 100 years. Second, in direct response copywriting, we have a system of copy chiefs, seminar teachers, books, and mentors like myself who help people improve their performance. And we have high performers who have set standards for what high performance looks like. So clearly the Anders Ericsson definition of deliberate practice can apply to what we do. Now, another author I really like, and I can't find the book, so I had to get a Kindle to find this stuff, but it's there somewhere if you want to go through all my books, probably like on the third level back, is Daniel Coyle. And he wrote a book called The Talent Code. And his term for practice and mastery is deep practice. It's interesting what he says. Deep practice is built on a paradox, struggling in certain targeted ways, operating at the edges of your ability where you make mistakes. That makes you smarter. Or to put it a slightly different way, experiences where you're forced to slow down, make errors and correct them as you would if you were walking up an ice covered hill slipping and stumbling as you go, that ends up making you swift and graceful without you realizing it. Okay, let's look at what he said. Practicing slow helps you go fast. Making mistakes makes you smarter. I don't know. When I went to school, I don't remember a single teacher who told me that. But today, through my experience as a copywriter and a coach, I know what Coyle is saying is true. And one more definition. Um, It's really more of an example. Robert Greene wrote one of the two books called Mastery we'll talk about today. The other book titled Mastery is by George Leonard. We'll talk about that too. And the George Leonard book is my favorite one. But back to Greene. His book is pretty good too. And in a podcast interview 11 years ago, he says that the practice other people call deep practice or deliberate practice. He calls it resistance practice. And he tells the story of the great basketball player, Bill Bradley. 
Now, this may be surprising if you're a Bradley fan, but he says originally Bradley wasn't all that coordinated or fast, but even as a child, he was tall. He would practice dribbling, passing, rebounding over and over again. At his home, in his bedroom, he would practice pivot moves. He put himself through a punishing practice schedule. And the way Green tells it, he transformed himself into this incredibly graceful, amazing basketball player. He had eyes in the back of his head. He could make the most incredible passes. And when he finally got to the NBA on the New York Knicks, people watched him and they said things like, this guy must be naturally gifted. How could he make such passes? He's an artist on the court. But it wasn't an artistry he was born with. It was an insane will to overcome his limitations and to practice, 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 practice until he became a great star. Interesting, right? Yeah, it reminds me of two things. Abraham Lincoln, I think, said, if I only had an hour to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first 45 minutes sharpening my axe. And uh, Stephen Covey in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People his seventh rule is spend time sharpening the ax. And I think that a lot of times, especially once we start to get good at writing copy, we might forget how important it is to, to go back and practice. Yeah, to keep sharpening the ax. Yeah, really good point. Okay, so part two is two false flags on the path of mastery. So when you decide to take the path of mastery, of course, it can be frustrating you're practicing hard on things that you don't do very well at first. And that's not a lot of fun of all the books I have on mastery. My favorite is this one this is the old cover. It has a new cover. Now it's the same book and it's George Leonard's book called mastery. I like this book because it's short and to the point. And Leonard was a terrific writer above and apart from this book. He was an editor at the great look magazine, which is no longer being published, but at its peak, it was selling nearly 8 million copies per issue. And it was often the second largest circulation magazine in the U S. So here's what Leonard had to say about the path of mastery. The general progression is almost always the same to take the master's journey. You have to practice diligently. Striving to hone your skills to attain a new level of confidence, competence. But while doing so, and this is the inexorable fact of the journey, you also have to be willing to spend most of your time on the plateau to keep practicing even when you seem to be getting nowhere. The plateau. The plateau is a long stretch between leaps, improvements, that everyone experiences while they're practicing away. And that's bad enough, but there are a couple of false flags along the route can make you think you're failing when you're not. And it's worth knowing about these because they happen to everyone and you're better off if you don't let them discourage you when they happen. False flag number one is sometimes it seems like you backslide and you're afraid you're getting worse, not better. And this happens especially after you get a breakthrough, so it's doubly disappointing. You may suddenly hit a high point in performance and then fall back a little before you land a new higher plateau. The new plateau is higher than the previous plateau, but it's not usual to be lower than the peak you hit when you had the breakthrough. But it can seem like you're getting worse when in fact you've gotten better, but you don't always realize it. False flag number two. For some reason, bumps in skill level happen more frequently at the beginning of your journey. That is, the plateau periods are shorter. So once you get better, the plateaus last longer and you feel like you are not succeeding because it's taking you longer to get to the next breakthrough. But that's only true if you measure success in terms of numbers, in terms of results. And yeah, that's the way the world measures success. That's the way we measure success in copywriting. What's your opt-in rate? What's your conversion rate? What's your average order value? But someone on the path of mastery measures success solely by whether or not they show up in practice today. It's that mm -hmm. simple. And that's why you need to learn to love practicing rather than to lust after results. Or as they say in the Navy SEALs, embrace the suck. Mm -hmm. I think what helps for me as a copywriter and as a marketer 
It's just the fact that I love the work that I get to do. So even when it gets a little bit mundane, even when there's not those peak breakthroughs, I still wake up every morning excited to do the work that I get to do. So finding work that gives you that fulfillment makes it a lot easier to stick with the practice. Yeah, put put a pin in what you just said because it relates to part four, which we'll get to in a sec. But that's that that is more important than people realize. And it's a twist on the whole do it you love thing. Um, it's not quite that simple. Uh, you don't just do what you love. But anyway, all right, let, let, but it helps. All right, so part three, what do you practice anyway? So people have heard this before. Bruce Lee, the great martial artist, said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. I don't think you should take this literally for our field. You need more than one kick in copywriting. But the key lesson for me from that quote is don't spread yourself too thin by practicing everything you can possibly think of all at once. Start simple, then focus and choose strategically. I have more thoughts on that in a minute. But first, let me review a couple other important influences on me. My client and friend, Igor Ledachowski, Who's a mess, who has a very hard to pronounce last name, but who's a master level teacher in hypnosis, explained to me how martial arts is taught. One small skill, which you drill on, then a second small skill, which you drill on, then two skills together, which you drill on, and so on. What he's saying is build major skill sets from the ground up, starting narrowly. And the other influence is Robert Greene. He puts this together really nicely when he says in his book, if we are learning a complex skill, such as flying a jet in combat, we must master a series of simple skills, one on top of the other. Each time one skill becomes automatic, the mind is freed up to focus on the higher one. At the end of this process, when there are no more simple skills to learn, the brain has assimilated an incredible amount of information, all of which has become internalized, part of our nervous system. The whole complex skill is now inside us and at our fingertips. We are thinking, but in a different way, with the body and mind completely fused. We are transformed. We possess a form of intelligence that allows us to approximate the instinctual power of animals, but only through a conscious, deliberate, and extended practice. Wow, that's powerful stuff. So here's my take on this, especially as it applies to copywriting. In the beginning, practice everything and practice hard. I mean, when you're starting out, but not 10,000 times. As you get better, you'll have natural strengths and weaknesses. Don't kill yourself trying to shore up the weaknesses if they're not crucial to the finished copy and results. Outsource where you can, get help, use AI. But a warning, and this is just in the last week, if you get info from AI, double check what you get everywhere else for accuracy. I keep getting reports from people who are using AI that it makes up a lot of stuff. Okay. Overall, back to copywriting away from ai overall though once you have developed the core skills even at an average level focus on what you're good at that will make a difference and do your smart practice on that one more thing about breaking the rules people break the rules innovators break the rules but the ones who are successful almost never break the rules right out of the box first they master the standard rules then they break them you really got to know and internalize the rules first. Don't skip steps. Understand what rule you're breaking, why it's there, or why it's ridiculous and shouldn't be there, and then why you're breaking it. And one more thing, let's get into the neuroscience side of this. Stay awake. This is easy. Anyone can understand it. No fancy specialized education required. This is from Daniel Coyle, the guy who wrote um, The Talent Code. Some neurologists consider a neural insulator called myelin to be the holy grail of acquiring skill. Here's why. Every human skill, whether it's playing baseball or playing Bach, is created by chains of 
nerve fibers, neural pathways, carrying a tiny electrical impulse, basically a signal traveling through the circuit. Myelin's vital role is to wrap those nerve fibers the same way rubber insulation wraps a copper wire, making the signal stronger and faster by preventing the electrical impulses from leaking out. When we fire our circuits in the right way, when we practice swinging the bat or playing the note, our myelin responds by wrapping layers of insulation around that neural circuit, each new layer getting a bit more skill and speed. The thicker the myelin gets, the better it insulates and the faster and more accurate our movements and thoughts become. Uh, Daniel Hoyle continues, myelin is important for several reasons. One, it's universal. Everyone can grow it more swiftly during childhood, but all throughout life. And this is really important. It used to be thought by the establishment, by academic psychologists, that our brains stopped working, growing. They, they just were like fixed and set when we became 21 or 25. 25, I guess, because that's when you can rent a car, right? That's no longer the, the prevailing theory. The fact is, our brains are rewiring themselves all the time. So you can still grow myelin even when you're as old as me. It's indiscriminate. Its growth enables all manner of skills, mental and physical. And myelin is imperceptible. We can't see it or feel it. But we can sense its increase only by its magical seeming effects. Most of all, Daniel Coyle concludes, however, myelin is important because it provides us with a vivid new model for understanding skill. Skill is a cellular insulation that wraps neural circuits and grows in response to certain signals. Okay, that's what he said. Here's what I want to say about that. Myelin is made up of protein and fat, and it insulates neural pathways. Simple. Simple. I like to think of myelin like old school recording tape made with something called mylar. Now, they're not the same thing because mylar is a plastic made in the lab and myelin is an organic substance made in the body. But they sound similar, and I found this to be a useful analogy. The myelin in your nervous system records skills, so they become closer to automatic. You can just play them back when you need them. Okay, so that's myelin. Now, as far as what to practice when you're on the path for copywriting, the mastery path. Deliberate practice is not simply hand copying headlines or sales letters over and over. That's not deliberate practice. Now, it's useful to do that in the beginning for a couple reasons. You get a sense of the rhythm of good copy and, and the words, and you get a sense of the flow. But smart practice comes in when you start to analyze what you're doing, find the errors or find the weaknesses and make improvements. And that's where having a mentor becomes really valuable. You can do it on your own, but accuracy and speed increase when you have some expert guidance. So there's a book, and I can't remember, or I can't pronounce the name of the author, but the book is called Flow. Have you mm -hmm. heard of it? Yeah, and I can't pronounce his name either, and I've been trying to learn for 20 years. <laughs> but it, he, it's like four or five syllables, and it's Polish, and it doesn't read like it. you would say it. And, yeah. And it's a great book, Flow, yeah. Yeah, he has a part in there where he talks about practicing and getting into the flow state. And one of the things that he talks about is making sure that what you're doing is something that you're comfortable with and it's inside of your competency zone. So it's not too far of a reach, but it's just barely expanding that competency zone. Mm -hmm. And that way you're not doing something that bores you because it's so repetitive and so comfortable. You're bringing in a little bit of new and a little bit of challenge, but not so much that it discourages you and finding that uh, practice level where you can practice and you can learn at the same time, but not be so challenged that it discourages you into giving up is kind of like that sweet spot when it comes to practice. That, that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, some people like to go balls to the wall and, you know, just try and do the impossible. And, Sometimes maybe that's necessary or a good idea, but, but but what you're talking about is not as dramatic or heroic, but it's a lot more productive. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's really good. Yeah. Okay, part four relates back to something you said before. It's 
what gets you on the path and keeps you going. So one question that could come up is why isn't everyone who works hard on the path of mastery? And the short answer is maybe they're not working hard enough on the right things. But more than that, maybe it's because they're not obsessive enough. But what makes a person obsessive? I can't answer that from the official licensed psychologist point of view. But Robert Greene has an answer that really resonates with me. He says, the basic elements of this story are repeated in the lives of all great masters in history. A youthful passion or predilection, a chance encounter that allows them to discover how to apply it, an apprenticeship in which they come alive with energy and focus. They excel by their ability to practice harder and move faster through the process. All of this stemming from, this is key, the intensity of their desire to learn and from the deep connection they feel to their field of study. At the core of this intensity of effort is, in fact, a quality that is genetic and inborn. Not talent, not brilliance, which is something that must be developed, but Instead, a deep and powerful inclination towards a particular subject. He says, this inclination is the uniqueness, and the uniqueness is revealed to us, I'm quoting again, to us through the preferences we innately feel for particular activities or subjects of study. In our culture, we tend to equate thinking and intellectual powers with success and achievement. In many ways, however, it is an emotional quality. It is an emotional quality that separates those who master a field from many who simply work at a job. Our levels of desire, patience, persistence, and confidence end up playing a much larger role in success than sheer reasoning powers. Feeling motivated and energized, we can overcome almost anything. Feeling bored and restless, our minds shut off and we become increasingly passive. I've seen this over and over again in the people I mentor. I would say all are maybe a little above average intelligence, a few are at the genius level, but many are not that exceptionally smart or talented. The ones who succeed, though, all have one thing in common. They want it a lot. And that desire is the fuel that propels them to do the things that you need to do to get on the path of mastery. It reminds me of going to school where you're always told you're not good at this. So you need to practice more. You need to spend more time doing this and to contradict. I don't think that that's a valueless statement, but one thing that I've learned as an entrepreneur and as a copywriter for a lot of different businesses is that A lot of times the best business people are the ones that say, hey, the one thing that I'm good at, the one thing that I find a lot of joy in, the one thing that drew me to this business in the first place, I'm just going to double down on that and I'm going to build a team that can do all of the things where I'm not so great at, that I'm not so driven to do. And it's one of the it's one of the things that as a kind of like a self-employed or entrepreneur or a business owner, we have the luxury of doing that. But yeah, finding that thing that makes you excited to get up in the morning and doubling down on that and then finding people who have strengths where your weaknesses are instead of trying to constantly put your energy into the things that you just don't enjoy anyways, finding people who do and building a team is, uh, I think yeah. it's a key to success. Yeah. That, that reminds me of a quote I read a long time ago about Warren Buffett, right? It said he can multiply two 20 digit numbers in his head, but he can't screw a nut on a bolt. yeah exactly he doesn't need to he can hire someone to do that exactly (laughs) do all right uh do we want to do a recap real quick on the four uh the four principles that we covered today yeah absolutely that sounds good um so part one first principle is practice doesn't make perfect but practice for mastery keeps making you better and better So, you know, again, now that we've gotten to the end, we know you to really become a master, you've got to somehow innately like it or really transform yourself into liking it. And then practice 
and get better at the things you're best at within that field. Uh, part two is two false flags in the path of mastery. In other words, there's going to be some tedium and some disappointment. Um, don't take that as a sign you're not doing well because that it all it, it's a sign of is that you're doing the right thing and some days are better than others. Okay, part three, what do you practice anyway? Well, you know, based on what you said, I think you need to learn everything. Maybe you need to do a little bit of that school thing and improve on your weaknesses in the beginning. But at a certain point, when you get good, just focus on the things you're really good at. I mean, I remember that Tiger Woods, you know, would have a a video analysis, uh, like, a, I don't know, 20 or 30 segments of his swing. So he would, like, go, you know he gets someone else to drive the golf cart, right? Okay. Um, part four, what gets you on the path and keeps you going? Well, it's, it's desire and it's enjoying what you're doing. And if you're lucky enough to have a natural inclination to do this, and you know, that's what I found with copywriting and with coaching that I, I enjoy them. I like to do them. I mean, I was good and successful as a journalist, but I didn't particularly enjoy it now that I think about it and um, some other things I've done. But so, yeah, so um, the more you enjoy it, the easier it's going to be to do these things. All right. And all of the books that you mentioned are going to be linked in the show notes. I want to shout out real quick. The Mastery by George Leonard is actually a free download on Audible. So if you have an Audible account, you can get that book for free. And I would recommend doing that. And David, thank you so much for putting this episode together, man. And uh, I'm glad that it was copywriting and not journalism because... Um, I, I much prefer working on a podcast about copywriting than I would a podcast about journalism. Believe me, I, you know, I, I, I would still be drinking heavily and in a very bad mood if, um, if, if it were journalism. So I'm glad to. All right, man. And if you enjoyed this episode, like we enjoyed putting it together for you, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com. We've got over 300 other episodes about copywriting there as well to help you hone and master your skills as a copywriter. So copywriterspodcast.com. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later.